Welcome back. This is Neil, and I believe it's time for another boot camp. We're doing tutorial 12 today. We're going to talk about heat of battle, and then uh, there are different parts of heat of battle, but we're going to focus mostly on berserk when I run through some examples at the end. The other heat of battle aspects, there are four of them that come out, are relatively simple. Berserk is probably the most complex, and I'll do some examples of that. Of the, I'll do examples of all four, but we're going to focus primarily on Berserk. Let's run through a few slides. I'm a nerd. I used to do lots of presentations when I was in the corporate world, so I build PowerPoint slides. So bear with me. Feel free to jump straight to the uh, examples. There's timestamps below. Go ahead and do that. If you want to run through these real quick, you can fast forward through them. Whatever you guys want to do, go for it. So let's step through heat of battle. Uh, like snipers, the second bullet here, um, heat of battle is another uncontrollable fate slash cauldron of battle type of mechanic. It's a mechanic that the player has really no control over. Um, it happens as a result of a die roll, snake eyes in this case. And then you roll on another table and there's a result. And you really have no control of what the outcome is going to be. Sometimes you don't even have control of the units after they're affected by heat of battle, specifically berserk. They kind of start doing their own thing based on some rules that have to uh, be adhered to after they go berserk. And I'll go through those later. Um, heat of battle occurs whenever an original two snake eyes is rolled on a morale check or a rally attempt, but not a self-rally attempt. That's important. Um, self-rally, if you roll snake eyes on a self-rally, that's a field promotion, which is a different, it's kind of like heat of battle, but it's its own thing. And I'll talk about, maybe I'll talk about that at the very end of the video because field promotions is very, very simple. Um, heat of battle is not applicable to a lot of units that are either borderline heroic berserk already or in situations where it's just not conducive for them to go berserk or become heroic such as units that are bonsai they're already kind of worked up in a frenzy they have high morale they don't pin things like that um, obviously units that are berserk already units that are climbing crews heroes already they can't go heroic human wave units panji morale checks parachute Units, units falling from the sky typically aren't going to go b heroic and go berserk. Uh, passenger rider crew, units that are swimming, units that are unarmed, units that are waiting um, in water or surf. I may have forgotten a few, but that's the majority of them right there. So heat of battle does not always apply to every unit in every situation. If you roll snake eyes on a morale check or a non-self rally rally attempt. Now let's go through the uh, slides, or sorry, the uh, results on the next slide. I put in this homemade heat of battle table over on the right, and there are four outcomes to this. And I'll go through each of the, each one of these in the next slide. There's hero creation, battle hardening, berserk, and surrender. And outcomes can vary uh, by nationality and circumstances. Some nationalities don't surrender. Some nationalities don't go berserk. They surrender instead. And there are some situations and some historical scenarios where some of these things might or might not happen. So make sure you read SSRs. Make sure you read the special text in this uh, bottom section to uh, that, that's color-coded to the uh, four results in the table to know when certain nationalities and units are going to do certain things based on the heat of, the, heat of battle die roll. Uh, another thing to notice on the table is the die roll... If you roll a 5 or a 6, there's an overlap between hero creation and battle hardening. So if the final die roll on the heat of battle table is a 5 or a 6, you get two results. It's kind of that bonus area. Um, the unit battle hardens and a hero, hero is created. So if it's a squad, the squad goes up in quality and a hero pops out of it. If the unit is a single man counter, if it's a leader... Um, his leader leadership quality goes up and he becomes a heroic leader. So that's that sweet spot, five or six on the final uh, modified die roll on the heat of battle. 
Um, as I mentioned before, some units and nationalities are immune to berserk and or surrender. Make sure you read, again, the table on the right or the table on the rat charts or whatever tables you're using. Um, and again, it also affects leaders. So yes, a leader can become heroic, better in quality, battle hardened. It can go berserk. And then it can cause units it's stacked with to go berserk as well, a whole stack, depending on how many there are. And it can, a leader can even surrender, depending on the circumstances. Let's summarize, let me summarize each of the four results. So if you get a hero creation out of heat of battle, this creates a powerful uh, single man counter that's immune to cowering, pinning, and breaking with a nine morale and a minus one die roll modifier. A minus one die roll modifier not, does not act as a rally modifier because uh, heroes cannot rally units, but it acts as a die roll modifier to fire attacks even if you're stacked with another leader, even if you're stacked with another hero, even if units are not, uh, a fire group is not adjacent to each other. So he can affect, if you have two units, um, that are in hexes uh, next to each other, and there's a hero in one hex with a squad, and there's another squad alone, that fire group gets the minus one die roll modifier. Um, heroes are also good for handing them demo charges and say, take out that bunker, take out that fortified building, what have you, because they don't pin and they don't break. They take a wound check instead of uh, breaking. So they can... They can usually, unless they the, the opponent gets a really good die roll with a really good negative modifier during first fire, um, they can often get close to targets and chuck demo charges into buildings and whatnot. Uh, the next one is battle hardening. Very simple. Uh, the unit, squad, or half squad, or leader um, gets upgraded in quality. So, you know, a first line would go to uh, an elite. A second line would go to a first line etc. Uh, third is berserk or leader. Um, an 8-0 leader would go to an 8-1, 8 minus 1 leader. Um, berserk. This causes a unit to have, they go berserk, they have 10 morale. The, they're immune to many adverse effects similar to the hero, such as pinning, uh, that kind of thing. And they charge enemies units in their line of sight. Uh, closest enemies in their line of sight. So this is the part where you don't really have control over the outcome of the heat of battle die roll. If a unit goes berserk, you have really no control on where they run. They just, their next movement phase, they just charge out of that building or those woods, wherever they are, and charge the nearest thing they see. And if they start charging the nearest thing they see, during that charge, if they see something that's closer on the way, they'll turn direction and, and charge those units instead. And they'll just charge right into that unit's hex, taking all the fire that they're going to take and try to engage them in close combat uh, later on. So Berserk can be good and bad. They have 10 morale, but sometimes you don't want your units to go to Berserk and running through the open, charging uh, enemy units. Then the fourth thing is uh, Surrender. Uh, this causes the units to break Yes, even if you roll snake eyes on that morale check or rally attempt, they break anyway, um, and they disrupt, and they possibly surrender to adjacent enemy units. If they're not adjacent to, to uh, enemy units, often that means they will um, go berserk or battle harden if they're things like Japanese in a peel box, et cetera. If you look at the table on the right, which uh, I should have put it in the video, I put it on the right here. Um, then before I go into examples, I have one teaser for the next uh, tutorials. Tutorials 13 through 17, we are gonna do a, let's play the guards counterattack. So I'm gonna have five sessions, a session for each turn of the classic scenario, the guards counterattack. It's going to be fully animated uh, playthrough in five parts. I'll play, be playing both the Russians and the Germans, and we'll apply all the rules that we've uh, learned up to this point, everything from basic uh, firepower factors, movement, defensive fire principles, maybe a little bypass in there, uh, 
I haven't covered close combat yet. I'll probably call it, cover close combat after this, but there will be some simple close combat in this scenario. So look for that after tutorial 12, which is this one. We'll do five sets of videos to play through the guards counterattack um, to show everything that we've covered so far in these boot camp scenarios. So let's go into some examples, starting with the, in the order they're listed in the table to the right. And I'll leave that table up. Um, well, actually, let's go to the gameplay surface. And I'll put the table up over here in this white area, which I'm probably not going to use because I don't think I'm going to be doing a lot of writing in this uh, boot camp tutorial. We'll just refer to this table and move some counters around and, around and show you what will happen if uh, a heat of battle occurrence happens during your game. Okay, let's talk about hero creation. There are two situations. Um, let's say Sergeant Todd is with this uh, 458 unit here. And you roll, you take a morale check from fire at some point, and you roll, roll snake eyes. And then you roll again on the uh, table and you get hero creation. Um, Let's say for either one of them. If you roll snake eyes, or sorry, snake eyes, and then get uh, heat of battle and hero creation for a squad, what happens is a hero pops out of that. If you heat battle harden, or sorry, heat of battle Sergeant Todd, and a hero creation happens with a single man counter, a leader. He becomes a heroic leader. the the real The difference between these two is I'll just put both of them out there. A hero versus a heroic leader is a hero um, cannot rally units. Uh, he can. He has a minus one die roll modifier that applies to to hit an infantry fire table. If he's say he has a piot in this case, since he's British. A heroic leader, his morale may go up to nine. In this case, it would go up to nine because his base, Sergeant Todd's base morale is eight. But if this was, say, a 10 minus two leader, um, his morale would still be 10 minus two. But if he's a morale lower than nine, his heroic leadership or a heroic leader's morale would become nine. Um, in this case, Sergeant Todd would have some of the abilities of this hero in that it could fire uh, some support weapons by himself with a penalty and that sort of thing. But that's a, the main difference between these two is the hero cannot rally units. Sergeant Todd is still a leader. It's just he's heroic and has a few more extra abilities on top of um, his normal leadership abilities. Now let's go into battle hardening. Battle hardening is pretty simple as well. Let's say, let's take uh, that hero off. Let's say uh, this squad here, heat of battles, rolls uh, battle hardening, rolls a seven, say, for example, on the final result. In this case, if we look at the table, the British get a minus one modifier, which is good. The lower the final die roll on the heat of battle, the better the results you're going to get. Well, let's say this unit battle hardened. Um, what happens in battle hardening is a unit goes up to the next uh, quality level. In this case, they would go up to their second line. You can see the two up here in the corner. So they're a second line squad. They would go up to a first line squad, a four, five, seven, with smoke ability, which is a little strange because. I don't know where the smoke grenade suddenly came from, going from this unit to this unit, but that's the way it works. In the case of nationalities that have, uh, say, multiple qualities at a certain level, say that there was another uh, first line here um, in their nationality, the the way it works is the none of the strength factors can go down. And when you go from second line to first line in this case. And um, you must take the worst of the two upgrades um, when you go from quality, from this case, two to two to one. Okay. 
and that applies to half squad. So you st you say you stay the same unit size. You just go up to the next highest quality. In the case of this elite squad, if they battle hardened, elite is the highest quality you can get. But the British have a second um, unit that's elite status, a six four eight. So even if you could upgrade, even though they're at the highest, this would violate the rule that uh, none of the strength factors can go down because their range would go down. You couldn't upgrade anyway because elite's as high as you can get, but this would also violate it anyway because their range would go down. You wouldn't be able to upgrade even if that rule didn't exist. So what happens in this case is the 458, they go fanatic, and I did not pull out a counter for fanatic. Essentially, fanatic units um, have their morale level. They have a plus one morale level, and they may not disrupt. Remember all the things for fanaticism. I don't. They may not disrupt, but they're, the main thing is their morale level uh, goes up one. So they'd be a four, five, nine fanatic unit. That's it for um, battle hardening. A Sergeant Todd, if a leader battle harden, Sergeant Todd would go up to a 9 minus 1. If he battle hardened again, he would go up to a 9 minus 2. I think British units have 9 minus 2, and so on. They just keep getting better. Um, squads get limited to elite status. That's as high as they can go. I doubt you're going to have a unit, a squad such as Sergeant, or a single man counter such as Sergeant Todd battle hardened all up, all the way up to like a 10 minus 2 minute. 10 minus 3, you would have some extremely lucky rolls in a scenario like that. You might you might, might get one battle hardening out of him in a scenario, if you're lucky. The other thing to note is if you got a result of, over here on the table, if you got a result of hero creation and battle hardening, what would happen would be, say there's 447, they would go up to, they'd be replaced by a 457, and you would get a hero on top of it. Bonus. I like it when you get uh, that five to six sweet spot final die roll um, for heat of battle when a squad battle hardens. Uh, next, let's talk about berserk. So if you get a berserk result on the table, basically your units get uh, bloodlust, I guess, I guess you would call it. Um, but they only uh, go berserk if there's a uh, enemy unit in its line of sight. If there are no enemy units in its line of sight, they battle harden instead for the most part. Um, if you look here on the table, you can see non-elite Italian slash Axis Miners surrender on a final heat of battle die roll greater than or equal to 10. So for the most part, they would surrender or potentially surrender instead of going berserk but the vast majority of units will go berserk on a 9 3 11 if they have a uh, enemy unit in their line of sight now let's say th these units went berserk here right there and let's say these guys weren't in d oops, they weren't in d3 the this squad when they go berserk and they end up rolling uh say a seven and they get a I'm sorry I'm talking berserk an 11 minus one for minus two they're elite and British so that would be a nine they would still go berserk um, they have no enemy unit in their line of sight they can't see these guys here they're kind of behind the hedge here can't see them they would not go berserk they would battle harden instead but they're at the highest level. They're at elite already, so they would go fanatic. You would put a fanatic counter on them. But let's say this squad was back here in D3. They do have a line of sight to them. There are some hindrances, but that doesn't matter. They still have a line of sight. They would go berserk. And the first, not the first thing they do, the next thing they do, depending on what turn and phase it happened in, they would charge towards... Uh, D3. They have to charge the uh, nearest unit in hexes, not movement factors. Any, the thing that's closest to them, closest to their vision, they will start charging 
uh, in their next movement phase, new movement phase. They can still defensive fire when they're marked berserk. They can still advancing fire. Um, no, they cannot advancing fire. I'm sorry. They can prep fire. Um, and they cannot assault move when they actually do their charge. So in this case, let's say it's the next movement phase. Um, all the prep fires taking place. They cannot prep fire, obviously, because they have to move. They have to charge. They're going to start charging this unit. So they're going to start going like this. They're going to charge this unit here. They're going to go one. They can still see these guys. Two, and right there, they're going to go, oh, these guys are two hexes away. Or these guys are even two hexes away. I don't think uh, back here, I don't think they can see that hex. Let's just assume they can't, they can't see that hex from here. They're going to go to here, and they're going to change targets. They're going to go, oh. These guys are closer. Let's charge them instead. So <clears throat> then you would charge one of these units. Let's just say they charge these units. So they would go one, two. They would go this direction. They have eight movement factors and a morale of ten. Two, three, four over the hedge. And these units might, might be firing now or before. Um, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. And at this point, the German squad would be forced to triple point blank fire in whatever sub defensive fire phase they were in, whether it's first fire. I'm assuming they probably would have first fired here or subsequent first fire or final protective fire. And they could fire... Uh, at this unit running into the hex, as we know from our basic uh, first fire principles, the number of times equal to the movement factors spent going in there, which would be one in this case. So this unit could only fire once as the unit ran into that into that hex. And uh, if they survive all defensive fire, um, they would be in close combat. At the end of the turn, they could advancing fire, but they would be locked in. Uh, they'd be in close combat uh, at the end of the turn. And then if close combat wasn't resolved, they would be locked in melee. And uh, units stay berserk until, um, well, they return to good order. Um, after they've basically eliminated uh, an enemy unit in their location um, or in close combat. So they basically have bloodlust until they kill something or things are out of their line of sight and they'll keep charging. If they aren't able to kill something, in other words, if uh, I ran in here, I advancing fired on these guys and broke them. And they had to route away in the route phase, come back here, wherever. Um, they didn't eliminate a unit with advancing fire using triple point blank fire, nor will they eliminate anything with close combat. So they didn't eliminate the unit that they targeted. They would still be berserk. And the next movement phase, they would charge the next nearest thing in its line of sight, which would, unless this guy moved away, would be probably be this guy. So berserk units, you don't have a lot of control. You don't have any control on where they run to. You have control over basically rolling the dice on triple point blank fire during the advancing fire phase and a close potential close combat roll uh, at the end of the turn. That's really, you, you have no control of them until they kill something, they survive, and they go back to uh, normal good order. Um, there are some subtleties in there regarding target chain change or um, going berserk while you're moving. So if this unit's moving, you know, if he's moving through, if he's moving to here, and some of these units fire on them and get a morale check, and you battle hard and go berserk, you actually, you may have wanted to move to here somehow, 
you immediately stop your berserk and you start charging the nearest thing in hexes in this case it would be these guys they would stop and just suddenly start charging in the middle of the movement phase that started normally not as a berserk charge the number of movement factors you would have left would be equal to eight minus whatever you've spent up to that point in this case they would have seven left because they spent one to go here boom they go berserk and then they start charging over to this guy okay that's a uh, basic berserk in a nutshell adds a lot of chaos to the game can be fun, can be frustrating, depending on the situation and uh, what's going on. Okay, the last thing that can happen if you look over here at the table is uh, surrender. That's when you roll very poorly on the uh, heat of battle chart. And depending on the uh, nationality, um, it can either that can either turn into berserk or battle hardening. Um, if you look at the third sub bullet in the notes on the bottom here. Treat as berserk if Japanese, Gurkhas, partisans, fanatics already, commissars, SS versus Russians, or subject to no quarter. Um, the, that that last part's pretty easy, no quarter. Unit, if no quarter is in effect, units don't surrender. They are going to um, try to rout away, essentially. Because if they surrender, they're going to be killed. That's what no quarter is. Uh, obviously, Japanese do not go, uh, do not surrender. They will go berserk instead. Thus, the uh, plus four um, modifier on the die roll that usually puts Japanese up into. They usually go berserk a lot of the time because you end up plus four. You're in the berserk zone already, nine to eleven. Or if you get twelve and above, that transfers into from a surrender into a berserk so japanese go berserk fairly uh fairly often but surrender only happens if you are uh adjacent well like i said before they break even if you rolled two even if you rolled snake eyes on your morale check or rally attempt um you break you don't rally and you become disrupted, and if you're adjacent to a known good order, good order uh, enemy unit, infantry or cavalry, um, you will surrender. Oh, you also become disrupted. If you are not uh, adjacent, um, you will only become disrupted instead. You will not, you not, will not surrender. So, in other words, if uh, these guys here ended up getting a surrender result, there's no one to surrender to. There's no one adjacent to them. They would just be broken and just dis disrupted. So surrender, the surrender option on the the result on the heat of battle table is fairly simple. Adjacent, you surrender. Not adjacent, you're broken and disrupted. Okay, that's it for the heat of battle. The last thing I wanted to touch on was uh, field promotions, which is pseudo uh, heat of battle. That's when a uh, unit rolls snake eyes on a self rally uh, attempt, not the first self rally attempt of a game. So not leaders, in other words. So if you have a squad, if it's a German turn, they're able, or any nationality is able to rally, make one self rally attempt as their first rally attempt for uh, units such as squads that are by themselves. So if I rolled, if I rolled snake eyes for these guys. <coughs> What happens with a field promotion is obviously they rally and then you get to roll on the field promotion table which will generate a leader and i'll see if i can put in the field promotion table right here um, you usually get fairly low quality leaders that pop out of this sometimes you might get i think a six plus one but a free leader is a free leader you can use them as rally bases you can just once you get a leader pop out if you're lucky enough to get you know a seven seven oh or eight oh that pops out you know say this guy say sergeant todd is a german in this example and he's an eight oh i mean you could just move him back make a rally base or whatever it's always nice to have a, a bonus leader come out of it um that's it for heat of battle slash field promotions you're going to see some of that i'm almost certain in uh, heat of battle in our playthrough of the guards counterattack, which we're going to do 
after this tutorial. We're going to do that in uh, tutorials 13 through 17, I think I said, and that should be fun. We're going to exercise all of these rules that we've learned, these basic rules. And then I think uh, 18, tutorial 18, is going to be close combat. And I guarantee you there will be close combat in the guard's counterattack. Again, it should be fairly simple, and I'll I'll go over it briefly when I go through that vi those videos, but I'll go over it in more detail in tutorial 18. So that's it for this tutorial, Heat of Battle, Berserk, and Field Promotions. And we'll see you in the next uh, video. Please leave a uh, thumbs up. I'd appreciate it for the uh, YouTube analytics to see ASL videos. I'd appreciate it a lot. And we'll see you next time when we uh, jump into the streets of Stalingrad and play the Guards Counterattack.